makes VT SCADA unique is that all of the components we're going to show you are built in out of the box. That's right, yeah. And there's a lot of components here that, beyond being built in, are components that you really don't see even as options in a lot of other software. So right. um, we're going to touch on each of these in a little more detail as we go through. But this slide is really just to kind of illustrate that VT SCADA has got sort of version control, alarming security, all of these different components that would normally be sort of something that you would add in or plug in or be a third-party piece that you're trying to join to your system. Right. All in the install. So it's one install, one license agreement. Which means that going forward, as you uh, as VT SCADA puts out new versions, which we do very, very regularly, minor and major, uh, all of those things will grow together in lockstep. You won't have an alarm dialer that suddenly doesn't want to talk to your SCADA system because they are the same thing. That's right. Uh, so the important difference is that the only difference between VT SCADA Lite and VT SCADA is that VT SCADA Lite is only 50 I.O. So it's for very small systems and uh, there's no alarm dialer. But you do get one internet client. You do get the internet client, yeah, which is used to look at VT SCADA on your phone, tablet, or even from another laptop that's maybe off-site or somewhere abroad. So. Right, great. So uh, that's a, a really crash course in VT SCADA Lite. And now let's sort of, uh, oh, and right now we're going to start off with kind of an inspirational story. Uh, we released VT SCADA Lite uh, just a few months ago. Uh, and already there are people who are using it in real world situations. Because unlike a demo, this is a perpetual license. Uh, it, it doesn't expire. It doesn't limit your runtime. So it's, it's ready to go. It's, it's a, an industrial class of software that you can uh, put to work right away in your water and wastewater system. And we're going to talk to someone who did. That's right. So uh, speaking after we put on a short video here of what they've done will be Jason Bell of JMJ Automation. So he's from Alabama in the USA. And he's got about 10 years' experience in the SCADA industry, and he's been a VT SCADA system integrator for a couple of years now. And he was kind enough to put together this really great short video describing uh, what he did for one of his customers using VT SCADA Lite. And then afterwards, we're going to chat with him a little bit and uh, find out a little more. So here is... Welcome to JMJ Automation. Here we're using VT SCADA Lite for a smaller water system. One thing that VT SCADA Lite has allowed us to do is reach out to smaller customers who it, without it would not be able to afford SCADA at all. In this example we have a single well and a single tank and it's supplying water to about 400 customers. We're using the SEL, um, Schweitzer Engineering Laboratories um, pump automation controller for as the PLC and there um this controller is awesome because it comes pre-configured and it's a plug and play device that allows you to put it in a pump up situation as if you're filling up a well for water or emptying a wet well in a wastewater application in this application we're using it in the pump up situation and in tank mode you have set points so you can set the set points to um, whatever cut on and cut off levels you want. You can alarm uh, on high level alarm, low level alarm. In timer mode you can tell what time you want it to turn off and what time you want it to turn off. In switch mode, that's a local mode where they have like a Mercoid switch um, pressure, uh, pressure switch local and they can put it in switch mode. They can see if it's calling for water, make sure the booster pumps running because we all know that you don't want to pump unchlorinated water into a um, water system and you see the motor um, running also. We're also able to set alarms on all of these and they're also able to get important data like motor runtime today and yesterday, cycles today and cycles yesterday. You know, whenever you're working with a larger electric motor, you don't want it starting, especially if it's a cross the line start motor, you don't want it starting and uh, stopping too many times in one day. So uh, the operator is actually able to keep up with this and, and uh, see it in real time. Uh, one person asked me, why would a smaller water system 
or smaller wastewater system needs SCADA. Well, here's an example. Here with the JAT water system, they don't have anybody on staff 24-7. They have an operator that they pre that they pay basically as a freelancer to go and check the system per uh, state requirements, go and check the system once a day. So this person goes and checks the well and checks the tank one time a day. Well, so each day they just get to see if there's a problem at that very moment. So for the next 24 hours, what happens if there's a problem? Or over a period of time, thanks to the built-in data logger um, and uh, historian that uh, v, um, VT, SCADA off, VT SCADA Lite offers, that they're able to um, get alarms right away. They're also able, um, able to um, see historical data. Um, is the pump running more right now than it has been in in the past and and that's a big benefit to a to a small system especially one that's not fully staffed that they don't get to check it every single day um anyway i hope this um helps y'all out thank you very much Great, and now we're here. Okay, uh, thanks for hanging on there. Um, so uh, we, I'm not sure how much uh, people were actually able to hear the video we were just playing. So tell us a little bit about what you did for the Jack Water System. Sure, for um, the Jack Water System, there are only 400 customers. They only have one well and one tank. And a system that small is not able to actually afford a full-blown SCADA system so what we were able to do for them, thanks to VT Scale Light, was uh, go in. Um, VT Scale Light, by the way, can run on a $200 Windows 10 computer from Amazon, and it, it does really well. By the way, it's only got two gigs of RAM and an Atom processor, and uh, we were able to um, uh, provide a solution for them that they could actually afford that they wouldn't be able to afford otherwise. And one thing that people ask me, why would a system that small need SCADA? Well, a, a really small water system gets checked per ATOMS and EPA's requirements. It gets checked once a day by an operator. So what about the other 24 hours? Uh, having SCADA in a small water system uh, allows you not only to check the historical data and you can use that for preventative maintenance but it also if you if you're crafty with it you can also use it for alarming um, the the without that jet would not have a solution they would they would still just be checked once a day and you just get a snapshot at that very moment that you're checking it what about the other 24 hours well now they're covered thanks to VT skate light that's really great. So how long have they been using this? They've been using it for about a year now, and oh, it's, it's worked flawlessly. Now, what brought you to VT SCADA? How did you become uh, involved in this software? I, I currently work for a utility that's water, wastewater, and electric, and they use surveillance as the HMI. Um, working so long in SCADA and working with various PLCs and HMIs, um, I've, I've come to learn what works and what doesn't work. Um, right. And I've also seen the pain points, you know, you, you build relationships with other water and wastewater systems and um, even electric utilities and I, I've, I've come to see the pain points of those um, uh, water and wastewater and electric systems, the ones with and without SCADA. And so um, a little over a couple years ago, we um, formed JMJ Automation. And that, that formed as a side business and has grown exponentially thanks to VT SCADA. Um, the very first thing, the, the very first decision we had to make was what HMI to go with. So uh, having worked with so many, but uh, Surveillant being the one that is in the current utility I work for, we went to Surveillant first. The, the only thing Surveillant could offer is their lowest package is 7,500 tags and it's you know I won't name pricing but it's very expensive and that does not come with a historian that does not come with um, uh, alarming and it, it just it, it's not practical especially for small and mid-sized systems 
so then we um I I thought about factory talk and I've used um Rotwell for quite a bit and um I don't like having to use Win 911 or third party applications and 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 honestly Rotwell tends to be um pro kind of proprietary and we wanted a more open source solution so um, then we looked at and almost went with inductive automations ignition. We uh, I downloaded ignition, uh, got in contact with those, their salespeople, and spent oh so dozens and dozens of hours just um, really getting my hands wet with them. And right before I pulled the trigger and JMJ decided to go with ignition, uh, I had a really good friend of mine. Um, I won't name his name, but a really good friend of mine that um, works for a company that actually has their own HMI, so that's why I should name his name, um, say, hey, look at VT SCADA. So I downloaded um, VT SCADA, and in literally about two hours, I realized that your slogan was absolutely right on. Um, uh, instantly um, intuitive. You, you couldn't have nailed it any better. Um, that's exactly what VT SCADA was, and if I were y'all, I would probably add something in there as far as uh, the time saver also, because a lot of these HMIs, whenever you try to, whenever you're building yeah. screens, time matters also. Not only are you instantly intuitive, but you're also quick. You can build these uh, screens very quickly. You can add graphics quickly, and um, uh, I think what actually just put the nail in the coffin and made us go with VT SCADA was the um, the fact that it's all a single install on all these other HMIs that I've worked with, Surveillance, Factory Talk, um, even Ignition. Um, the, the historian is not built in. You have to spin up a SQL server. Um, the alarming on some of them is not built in. And um, the, the amount of work it takes to get the SCADA um, the HMI configured properly is is ridiculous, honestly. With um with VT SCADA, it, it it's all in one package, like the screen that you first showed. Um, the historian is built in, the um data logging, alarming, all that's built in. So it's a single install, and um that's just this is this has worked out great for us. And then VT SCADA Lite um for our smaller customers. And it's just it's it's been the perfect solution for JMJ. And, and you've used this to actually create before a. I, um, before I let you go, sorry, Jason, I had a question come through um, from one of the um, attendees, and they just wanted to know um, if the Jack Water system is using Ethernet or another technology for their communication. Um, I tend to give long-winded answers. We, we tend to like cellular, however, they were a little bit outside of Verizon's range, so to, to be honest, they're using DSL. Okay. And um, they're using DSL with a static IP. We all know that you don't have to have a static IP. You can, you know, there's ways around that um, because you do want to access this remotely, but um, they're using DSL. That's great. Thanks, Natasha. And uh, we kind of have to, to, to move pretty quick from here, but, but just really quick, you, you use VT SCADA Lite to also create a demo application for yourself that you take with your hardware around to, to show to clients. Is that right? That's, right. Uh, that's correct. And we actually have a couple of them. Um, the one that you see in the picture that we're looking at is for the um, wastewater side. And um, the, the the thing is, whenever you go to a customer that's never had SCADA, it's hard for them to actually imagine what exactly they're getting. Right. The benefit of having VT SCADA Lite is that that little touchscreen computer that you, you're looking at there, that's 200 bucks on Amazon, and it's a 9-inch touchscreen computer running VT SCADA Lite um, flawlessly. You're, I'm able to take this unit around um, that's on the wastewater side and show the customer exactly what they're getting. Without um, VT SCADA Lite, that, that wouldn't be possible. Um, right. Or, you know, I could use an integrator license and it expires. You know, it, it's just, it's, it's really messy. But being able to use VT SCADA Lite streamlines it and it allows us to show the customer exactly what they're going to get before um, 
you know, before the sale. That's great. And are you using the um, that computer to host the historian and everything? Oh, absolutely. Um, that computer has four gigs of RAM and Atom processor. Uh, the one at the Jack Water system and 64 gig solid state. The one at the Jack Water system only has two gigs of RAM and um, uh, an Atom processor and 32 gigs of um, hard drive space. They're both being used and both working great with VT State Alive. Right. That's great. Great. Well, thanks, Jason. We appreciate you uh, you doing all this for us. You've put a lot of time into this, and uh, and you've done some great work here. Thanks a lot. Thanks, Jason. Yes, sir. So now uh, we're going to try to actually blow through some of these features that we've been talking about, that Jason's been talking about. Um, and to, we're going to, as much as we can, we're going to try to do it actually in VT SCADA. So, That's right. Yeah, last time we did a webinar, we spent a lot of time sort of building an application, setting up an application, doing some of the tags in that. Um, this time, I think you're going to grab an application from my computer. Yes. And um, and then we'll kind of show you some of the redundancy and some of the other features of VT SCADA. But like Chris said in the beginning, we're going to be moving very quickly through this. Um, but Please follow up with us in the end if there's anything that you think is really intriguing. Um, we can show it on here a little bit at the end if we've got a little bit of time. But um, And we can, we can stick also... around at the end of the hour. Uh, some of you may have to go, but we can stick around. That's right, yeah. And for, for those of you that aren't available, please follow up with us. We'd be happy to do another webinar with you or anything, like a private one-on-one -on -one tour, um, and we can show you the product in a little bit more detail. Okay, so here we go. Uh, what you've got here in the screen is what we call the uh, VT SCADA Application Manager, or VAM. So when you start it up, this is the first thing that you see. Now, uh, previous to the webinar, uh, David uh, and Ray created an application, that, a very small application that actually speaks to a simulated RTU on our server. And what I'm going to do is demonstrate how one uh, VT SCADA, how we, basically you can install VT SCADA on two different computers so that they are redundant to each other and they sync automatically. So I'm going to uh, down click this little plus sign for application wizard. I'm going to go get from workstation. Hopefully, uh, and this is David's server. So I should be able to now see all of the applications that are on David's server. I'm going to slow down and make sure that you see that before I move on. Yep, so um, the Great. demo app there that's running. And this demo app, I'm going to choose that, and I'm going to go next. And you've already clicked Start Application Now. And Finish. So, and oh. then you just log in with your user. So this is actually a new feature. Um, it's something that's just introduced to VT SCADA and VT SCADA Lite, and that's to pull an application from a server. You actually have to have credentials for that application now. So this will just take a few minutes to, to pull the application across the network. It was right. running on David's computer. And now I've started VT SCADA, and I've reached over, and I've grabbed that application, and I'm now installing it on my computer. And now our, and here we go, and now our that applications, quick. that was really quick, uh, <laughs> are, are synchronized. So any change that one of us makes in right. the configuration uh, menus will be propagated to the other automatically. Right. So let's just demonstrate this really quickly. I'm just going to change one of these uh, high-level pump on set points. So I've pulled this down slightly. So and then hopefully, so Chris, you've seen this uh, yep. indicator here change, and hopefully everybody on the screen share has seen that as well. Right. So changes in real time, changes made on one system are, are automatically uh, uh, propagated to the other. So do you want to jump through talk about drivers for a second? Oh, that's a good idea. Yeah. Let's go back to. Do you want to talk about them? Sure. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Yeah. So, uh, as Jason mentioned when he was talking, one of the things that he liked about VT SCADA was the integrated drivers. Um, and we just wanted to kind of share this with you because we know people have all sorts of different products. There's a lot of built-in drivers with VT SCADA that are very specific to certain PLCs or RTUs. Um, and there's a lot of generic things like Modbus and JSON, um, which are sort of more open communication protocols that are used by a lot of different devices. But we also wanted to kind of highlight that we've got things like uh, OPC and DDE, which can be used to connect to servers. And these are all included with every VT Skater or VT Skater Lite installation. That's great. Oh, sorry. So, no. 
Uh, so and uh, so we won't go through them in, in great detail, but on our website there's a, a list. You can see the link there. When you get the, uh, the PowerPoint, you can click on that and see all of the drivers. So if we jump to the next slide, I think we're going to talk about redundancy here a little bit. So rather than spend a whole lot of time on this, we sort of put some of this together. And a lot of the slides that you'll see, we're not going to talk directly to. We've kind of framed that for the information that you receive at the end of this presentation. Um, but I think if Chris and I jump back to the VT VTSCADE application, then maybe we'll add Chris as a redundant server. Oh, yes. Great. So uh, like I said before, Dave and I are now a, a synchronized application that spans two computers and this could be two different buildings two different sites uh, just have to be connected by a network uh, so, so but before I can be uh, uh, we can identify who's the primary and who's the backup I'll have to log in again we have to add me to the server list so I'm going to go into the configuration window and I'm going to select server list so this is extremely difficult so Chris is just typing in his computer name here, um, if he remembers it. <laughs> oh, no. Chris L. Laptop, I believe. No. Why did this work? This is so much easier before. Oh, no, that's not going to work. Um, Well, anyway, this is where you would do it. Embarrassingly, I don't know my own computer's name. <laughs> so if we had a little bit more time, we could pause on this. And if you click the server list, it would go through and show all the available servers. One of the reasons that it runs slow here is that we've got, uh, we're connected to the entire hmm. company. So we've got tons and tons of computers here. Um, it's, it can be a little slower to see the, actually, the server just, just populated oh, there. there we go. So you should be able to. Ah, Chris L. Dash laptop. Boom. So yeah. now we can decide who's the primary. I'm going to make myself the primary. Do you sure. want to be the primary? Yeah. Nope, that's great. So Chris has just come on as the primary. And that means that all of the, or as soon as he applies this, all of the PLC communication, RTU communication, will be going to Chris's computer. And then my computer is now starting to request the information from Chris's computer. So the way that we've done this, we've actually made these computers redundant for the, the HMI the configuration, the historian, the events and alarms manager, and the uh, thin client servers. Right. So if one computer goes down, everything moves over to the other one, and it's just seamless pickup from the other computer. And then when my computer comes back up, uh, the way we've got it configured right now, it would just jump back. But uh, you can make it so that you have to basically click or set it to move back to the other server. And you're not limited to how many uh, computers you can link in this way. Uh, VT SCADA Lite, as we'll tell you later, is available. Uh, your, basically, your first 10 copies are free, uh, period, just free. Uh, and you can actually link them all together as a, a redundant, uh, all of them being redundant servers to one another. Or, or they could all simply be workstations. Actually, they would be both, right, if that makes sense. So I think the next thing that we wanted to get into was uh, some of the mapping and stuff. So we showed you yeah. some drivers, and we talked a little bit about things like DMP3. Uh, but we want to show you some of the tools that are in VT SCADA, VT SCADA Lite, which you can use to really quickly see um, a distributed system that's sort of outside of a, a local plant, say, if you had a bunch of lift stations or whatever it might be. So, so this is the, the built-in tile page, uh, tiled page view. And basically, it's a visual menu that allows you to uh, see folders of pages or individual pages. And it allows you to, uh, to be able to oversee multiple pages at once. And I'm not sure if they're getting enough frame rate in what's being shown to the audience, but um, it's actually showing a live view of the pages that are up there right now. So it's not just a static image. Right. Hey, that's a good point. So I'm just going to go in here and look at remote sites. and. Choose this. So right now we've uh, Dave has added one site to our map, and here it is. It's this is in Bedford where we are right now. But all the map tiles are built in uh, out of the box. So as you can see, the frame rate may take a while to catch up, but you can basically click and toss and drag and zoom just like you would for a, an online mapping tool that you'd be familiar right. with. Yeah, it feels like Google Maps or something that people might be used to. Right. Um, the other thing about this is that you can set it up to cache the maps as well. Right. So if you have an offline system, then you can just cache an area 
and then have that available once your system is offline. That's right, because they, they don't expire, they remain in the cache forever. So at some point they do have to be online in order to, to, to store them in memory. So, and you'll notice if you click on the site, uh, this is a very simple uh, default page that pops up that's created that uh, contains the I.O. of that site. Uh, so that's mapping. We'll go keep moving quickly here. Where are we now? Oh, alarms. Right, so, and alarms, it's important to distinguish the difference between the alarm dialer, which is not included in right. VT Scale Light, and the alarms and the alarm management pages, which are included in VT Scale Light. So, what, and keep in mind that what we're showing you is with VT Scale Light. So, everything that we're showing you here today is stuff that you guys can do. Um, the alarm dialer is sort of a, it's a fancy tool basically to decide who gets phone calls, uh, who gets pages, who gets emails, and what order they go in, and how many times they get called. And I mean, they're, it's a it's a great tool, um, but it's not something that's included in VT Scale Light. So. So I'm just navigating using the uh, again the tile page view to navigate into the alarm page, and right now we have one active alarm. That's right. Why don't you go to the history just to, Ooh, yeah. um, and we'll maybe start there. So you can see that um, there's quite a bit going on here. Um, quite suspiciously, there's a few <laughs> alarms that keep going off. And, Something's terribly wrong yeah. here. And we, we may have done something to the configuration of the alarms to encourage a few today. <laughs> um, so if we go through, uh, maybe we'll go through the filtered pages here. So that was the history that you were seeing. Right now we can see that there's no active alarms. If we move over to the next tab, then we can see that there is an alarm. It's the alarm that we kept seeing over and over and over, but you can see that it hasn't currently been acknowledged. So Chris could click that to acknowledge it, and now it's gone from this view. Um, if we go back to, well, there won't be anything in the current shelf right now. So. Let's just talk about shelving for a minute. Shelving okay. is a feature that a lot of people aren't really familiar with. Most people, I think, are familiar with disabling alarms. Shelving is sort of similar, but it's really a good tool to displace um, disabling. What the shelving does is it prevents the alarm from showing up on the operator interface. It prevents the alarm from calling out. But it keeps the alarm data in the historian. So Chris, if you don't mind just right-clicking on one of the alarms there, not an event, but an alarm. Oh, right. Mm -hmm. And then just click on the shelf button there. So the other nice thing that we have in the shelving is that you're prompt with a time. So let's say that you want to shelve an alarm because you know that there's something faulty with a pump and it's going off maybe every minute. So you can say, okay, well, we know that that component is going to be fixed by the end of the week, so we'll just simply shelve until maybe a certain date or if it's something that's going to be short-lived, then we can say do it for 5, 10, 15 minutes, whatever it is. So the shelving tool, like I say, is basically keeps the data, which allows you to really um, go to your supervisor or go to whoever it is and basically have the data to back up that, yes, there is a problem, that this alarm didn't go off once every five seconds three times. It went off once every five seconds all day. Right. But luckily, it didn't bother you once every five seconds while it was happening. That's right. So it's a way of reducing nuisance alarms so that real problems don't get hidden in, in, in maintenance issues like replacing PLCs. That's right, yeah. So um, talking about nuisance alarms, why don't we go into some of the yes. uh, alarm stats? And a lot of what we're showing is based on the ISA 18.2 standard. Um, and this is a, it's sort of an engineering best practices standard. Um, and it's also one that is called up quite a few times in the ISA 101 standard that's getting a little bit more traction these days as well. Right. Uh, so you can see we've got four built-in. We have we, we also have a reports page that do reports on the historical data. But here in the alarms uh, manager, we have four built-in statistical, statistical uh, reports that basically help you zero in again on, uh, on, on data that would hide real problems. Right. And today, we've got something that's pretty basic. I think the system only has two alarms in it. So, you know, you can you can see that it's showing not a whole, whole lot, but if you imagine a larger system, then you can start to see how, seeing how often alarms are occurring, and also seeing some of the uh, alarm parameters that may point to the cause of why it's occurring more than it should be. Um, so becomes clearly, real value. Yeah, that's right. So if you see one alarm here, like this northern one, uh, that has way more instances than anyone else, and you know someone has to go out there and look at that. Uh, alarm floods, similarly, 
is a sort of time-based way of looking at alarm occurrences uh, so that you can see uh, basically the relationship of various alarms and try to figure out what's going on. So maybe there's a single alarm that, that triggers a whole bunch of alarms. Right, yeah, if perhaps something occurred and that caused a pump to stop and then you got mm -hmm. a low RPM or a low flow or whatever, you can have that kind of cascade of alarms. And this makes it very simple to sort of see how things happened over a period of time, especially if multiple events may have stimulated multiple cascades. Right. And then history is basically you can look at an individual alarm's uh, history of all the times that it was tripped. And then this one's interesting. Uh, Dave spoke of the uh, the ISA 18.2 standard, and basically, it, it it this is a simple way to look at your distribution of alarm priorities to make sure that you don't have everything be a high priority. Um, that's right. If you can imagine a system where everything is a high priority, then that's sort of the same as saying nothing is a high priority. Right. Because you are not able to quickly look at that situation and assess where you need to send a limited work crew. Yeah, that's great. So that's um, uh, that's those. Is there anything else? We also have filtering built in. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, you've got a filter on right now, actually, with the mm -hmm. date. Uh, did you want to maybe just jump back out of this one and show the uh, day and night mode? Just as, oh, yeah. as a general interest. <laughs> See, there's things that we take for granted when we work with these things every day. Uh, but this one always uh, goes off big. So this is... Uh, this is daytime mode and nighttime mode. Right. And another thing that people might be interested in is that you can quickly change on the in the view there with the fonts. Uh, you can quickly move through different font sizes and stuff. So that's great depending on what your screen looks like and maybe what the resolution of the monitor you're showing is. And I'm, I'm sure Dave probably said already, but uh, there's lots of simple ways to uh, create your own custom filters so that you can immediately horn in on the kind of uh, the, the kind of information that you need. So you can sort those alarms and and find out meaningful information right that's away. Right. Yeah. At some point, you may be looking at only alarms that were triggered because you're trying to diagnose an IT issue or a networking issue. So right. you can focus in just in that area. Now we don't have an active alarm. I wanted to add a note to an alarm. I guess we can do that in history for. Here, I'll give you one. Great. Ta-da! There we have an alarm. So uh, what I can do is right-click on that, and we see shelve, or we can add a note. So when we look at uh, like when we look at trends, or did we look at trends yet? No, oh, we haven't. Really. We have not. Okay. So in trends and in alarms, you can add an encrypted note. So this is very relevant to small systems who perhaps have been using their paper logbook to to to, to log anomalies or information. Uh, uh, to provide context. VT SCADA uh, out of the box allows you to do those things right in the software and you can attach those notes directly to uh, a specific alarm. So for example I can put in, uh, I don't know, bad thing. Bad thing happened. So you can add that. And you'll have to go to your alarm history there because the alarm came out of alarm upon came on. Oh I see. <laughs> it's uh, unacknowledged as well. There we go. So and I can uh, I've added. Well, bump me up before I could. All right. Add thing. And then you could also add another one onto that, so that you almost have like a like a chat bubble. So someone could say this bad thing happened, and someone else says uh, this has been responded to, no problem. And those yeah. things exist in the are encrypted, and they cannot be changed in VT SCADA or or without VT SCADA. Yeah. And you can add different notebooks to different areas. as right. right on and limited on alarm notebooks. Let's go to the trends here. Okay. Try to jump into that. Let's acknowledge that alarm. So uh, let's go to your just the main page yeah, the main. there. This is great. So. Um, maybe we should trend the, the tank right there, and then we can compare it to what's shown. Um, so you're looking at one day's worth of data right now. So Chris has used the, uh, the magnifying glass to zoom. Uh, you can also use a drop down here um, if you want to zoom different timelines. Um, but let's maybe click on our system notes and just go in and sh show a note there. So and then just uh, note. And drop the note wherever here. So what we're going to do is to add a note to the system notes. Now again, we could have a notebook set up for this specific tank, or we could have a notebook set up for you know an area, a plant, a water group. You know, depending on how you want to record this. 
Well, one of the really nice things about this is that when, say, a supervisor or a manager goes back and they want to see what happened, they want to know why a tank was drained or why a pump was shut off or whatever it was, then rather than trying to look through the notebooks and find what operator was working that day and exactly what happened, they're able to just click on the note. So maybe you could show that pop up there. So uh, you can see this red line here is where we put the note. So then they can pop up that, see that this is a note, and that see that that note was put in by Chris today um, so that the note is not just recorded for what date it's for, but it's also recorded when it was added, which is great. It's sort of diagnosing um, something. If you wanted to update details from, say, six months ago, then somebody can see that you added those today, not back at that time. Right. Now, uh, basically anything on the screen that was drawn there uh, using an I.O. value, uh, for example, this uh, 9.7 foot value here, or uh, this the value on this uh, dial or that dial, basically if you click as an operator, if you click on any of those objects that are driven by I.O., you will open them up in their own custom trend window. That's right. And actually, even if you click on something that wouldn't normally have a historian attached to it, right. BT Scale will build a temporary historian so that it's trending that data while you're monitoring it. Right, and by the way, this is real-time, this is a combination, this view of real-time and historical data. So basically, I can scroll this timeline back to when this tag was initially instantiated. And you can adjust how you see it, you can have a, a stacked over, or overlapping view, you can change the color and the thickness. So what's really important is that an operator, without the help of an integrator, can create their own trends and save them for reuse. Right. Let's just change one of the lines here, sure. maybe change the weight or the line type. So, yeah, I'm not into this black line. Let's make it uh, blue. Maybe a little thicker. Right, so you can see that. So, and you can see how somebody may spend some time actually setting this up and getting a system of these that they are happy with. Right. Right. And then, you know, after that, can you show maybe how they might save that so that they can quickly recall a setup list of trends that they've done? Sure. Now, this uh, this dialog up in the top left corner here basically allows me to add or remove uh, tags from this tag group, and then I can save the group as uh, I'm going to just call it Chris and I hit OK, and now all I need to do as this user when I come back again is I can just choose Chris from this drop-down menu, which I've already got open. So. so another neat thing about this is that if you look down in the bottom there, you see that there's actually some statistics coming up with the tags that you're using. So these are shown, these are fairly simple statistics that are up there. Um, there's also um, historian statistic tags that we have. So if you want to look at an average or a minimum over a certain time period, then you're able to set that up and configure that with VT SCADA. So we know a lot of people are using this for things like um, looking for leak detection and other things where they're doing, you know, um, average minimums over low utilization times and that. And then they're trending those on the daily thing to look for either that they fit in a, in a predicted window, right. or that they, if they change a certain amount, then they'll trigger an alarm. Great. Okay, so we have five minutes before we're supposed to start our Q&A, so we should probably move. What's next on our agenda? Alarms. Right, so next is the, next is a big topic. The next one is the Idea Studio. Oh, yeah, yeah, great. So we'll go right. back to VT SCADA. Uh, again, you can look at the PowerPoint right. at your leisure. So we've talked a little bit about using the application. Now let's the Idea Studio is really the environment that we have for developing and building the application. And, and I guess we should say this, uh, the VT SCADA Lite license is a, we call it a development runtime. So that means that you can use it as a runtime interface or you can be the developer. Right. So the difference between people who have a just a development license, and this would be a lot of the system integrators, the one that they have personally, um, would be just a development. And the development license doesn't allow you unlimited running. So the development runtime does actually allow it to do full development and to run without stopping. And you'll note, while we configure, we're about to open it up and start to configure, uh, the, the application is still online. We didn't have to turn it off. We didn't have to interrupt uh, alarming. So up here in the top right-hand corner, you'll see this little gear. And, uh, oh, no, that's not wrong. This little picture here. Uh, and this is what we call the application, uh, the Idea Studio. 
And you right away, I think if you look along the top, you'll notice that this looks very familiar, and that is that it's uh, recognizable right out of uh, Microsoft Office. And in fact, that's that's basically the kind of object that it is. So, uh, and then down the left-hand side, you've got all kinds of widgets, images, and shapes. And everything we show you is out of the box. There's there's nothing you have to pay extra for, or uh, but you can also drag in any any uh, any images you want. That's right. Yeah. In fact, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to close this, and I'm going to let uh, David do some configure. Oh, go ahead. Why don't you add an object just so sure. people can see sort of the drag and drop, or maybe the positioning, mm -hmm. and then I'll maybe augment that. So I've just dragged uh, this uh, this dial over. Now, typically with VT Skato, what we used to what we used to insist on was that people create your tags first and then use those tags to draw objects. And we still think that's the better way to do it. But now we support it the other way. So if you want to just take all these objects, drag them on the screen, and uh, I'm going to hit Control C, Control V, uh, C. So, um, so Chris, while well, you've got that there, some people might be wondering what that uh, yellow blinking box is in the right. middle there. Right. That just means that uh, this is not hooked to a tag. You'll notice that these things are moving back and forth, uh, just basically cycling through uh, through their, their limiting. And uh, it just means that this isn't real data, just a reminder to the user, because again, the system is online right now. And things are kind of set up to automatically want to align uh, so that you don't end up with a sloppy looking system. And basically, when I close this, um, this will propagate, uh, you can right. make it not do this, but uh, right now it's set up so that when I close the window, my changes propagate automatically to the other server. So right now I'm looking at them on Dave's. That's right, yeah. And now, just to show this going back and forth two ways as a primary and redundant server, um, I'm going to grab this one, and I'm actually going to link this guy to one of these values. So he's working on his own computer so right now. So I'm just going to bring in the driver here. Let's look at so. Yeah, that's right. I say it. I say it like it's simple, but a lot of I've just been here too long. I guess it, it feels like everything should work this way. So I'm going to select this value. So now you see that um, I'm showing the tank level here. So for those of who are looking, hope that they'll notice that the scale has changed from zero to twenty-five, which is the same as my scaled value for the tank here. I'm also got the units of feet. Committed it. Oh, I'm sorry. Kaboom! Now there we are. Now you should see this. So what you'll be looking at is the gauge is showing this the tag scaled value of zero to twenty-five feet, and it's also showing the units. And all of that was picked up automatically from the widget, pulling the information from the tag. So there, there's even links to alarms and other things which are built into the tag, which could change how the widget looks um, without any extra configuration. So you can see there's widgets for uh, HOA switches. There's a widget for uh, your for a small view of your alarm list that you can embed in a page. If you uh, wanted to go out and simply, uh, the, the simplest form of, of screen development is go out and take a picture of your process, drag that right in, which you can find out how to do in the help, and uh, and then start putting values on top of your picture. A lot of people do it that way, and it works really well. Yeah, we're seeing people basically bring in the schematic and then add little indicators and switches and things to kind of Right. highlight what's going on from the wiring perspective so that they can quickly diagnose if they have, have an issue. Now, we've got to make a decision here because we should be starting our Q&A and there's a few things uh, I knew this would happen we haven't gotten to. So we're going to really quickly touch on them and that is version control. So right now we've got this lovely dial that we've put here. Uh, basically, VT SCADA, which also is entirely unique, it natively has a configuration history built into it. So if I open the configuration menu and I go, thank you, version log, you can see that this young application uh, consists of my computer and Dave's computer. And these are all the changes that have been made by all the users on all the computers. And we didn't have to set this up. It automatically uh, starts recording everything that we do. Saves it in an encrypted file. So, uh, so nobody can tamper with it. So you can all, you could, if something went wrong, you can trace it. And also, because we're redundant, we talked about being synchronized. Uh, on each of these computers, and however many more we sync, uh, they're all going to have a copy of that version history. Right. And actually, even if you make a change set, which is a way to share an application via USB or other things, the version history will go with the change set file so that somebody else who picks it up can see the full history of what was there. 
Now, for those of you who are building applications for customers and maybe don't want them to have the full application development history, you can do what's called a snapshot. And that will basically give them something right. that contains a lot of the information but doesn't actually make it so that they can roll that back. And all that's in the help. All really, really simple to do. Uh, and right now, I'm very quickly, I'm just going to click on uh, what I think was the version that didn't have this dial. And I'm going to say, switch to this version. And it's going to show me what so, the code looks like. Yeah, so we can see a GUI transform. There's an event there. See, everything's, uh, uh, everything is done under the hood using VT SCADA. Uh, script. Yeah, so we can see a overview page change to an object on the page. So that's the code that's going to change. And I'm going to hit apply, and it's going to ask for for a why, and I'm just going to type in why I, I did it. Know. <laughs> yeah, because <laughs> demo. And you can see we've rolled back to that version. But every version we've had is now recorded, the version with the dial, and now the version without the dial as a new version. So uh, nothing is lost. No matter how many, t you don't roll back and lose everything that came after that. You get another version uh, where those changes don't right. exist. And I know you can't see it right now, but that change has been reverted on my right. computer as well. So uh, again, uh, that is usually a, a, a bolt-on for some other uh, SCADA systems. But uh, right. So next, do you want to touch on thin clients? We'll have to do it real quick. Um, Basically, in the time, in less than the time it took for you to watch us create a redundant server, you can create, you can set up your your thin client's uh, interface. So creating thin client is really just a matter of setting up. Um, it's really just a few clicks. You set up a server in just a few clicks. Basically, you say add. You type the name that you want for your server, and then that's it. Your server's there. Then you add what's called a realm. A realm is a thing that's kind of designed for bigger systems, I think, mostly. But um, So you just, again, any name you like for your realm, and then you add the application that you want to be inside of that, and then basically click Apply. It generates a URL, and that's the link to your server. It, it literally takes seconds. And this is what it looks like on the iPad. And I'll just show you, since you can't really see well on the iPad, uh, basically what the Thin Client uh, opens in any uh, HTML5 browser. So right now what you're seeing on the screen, as you can see, this is, uh, this is Chrome. Uh, so it doesn't have to be a mobile device. It can be your Mac. It can be your, um, your, your PC. So basically this is running off of our demo server right now. And, uh, and this is basically identical, completely, or almost completely identical to uh, the, uh, the full workstation, workstation experience. And this is something that anybody who's watching this can actually go on our website. Yeah. They can click a button. They can go in, and they can try this out. Right. In fact, here's our website. And if you go to, uh, well, right from the front page, you can see the trials and demos. And you can. It's the water thin client there. That's right. So you can uh, get the 90-day trial. You can do this thin client demo, which is what you're looking at. Or this is where you download VT SCADA Lite, which will hopefully you'll do immediately following uh, this webinar. So we invite you to, to open that up and try it for yourself. And for those of you who might be wondering why, why you would get the trial when you have VT SCADA Lite available, um, for somebody who wants to maybe put something in temporarily, so the, tr the trial does expire after a certain period of time, but it allows you to build an application for a larger system, try that. We know some people will put it on a laptop and put that laptop beside one of their other HMIs, and then they'll kind of wait the two of them and try to see which way they want to go with it. So like I say, as the trial allows you to do that with a much bigger system. You know? All right. So the last thing I'll say is uh, on this PowerPoint, there are links to support materials. One of them is a five-minute, zero to 60, step-by-step -step tutorial by our lead trainer, Andrew Harvey. Uh, so there's that link. There's a link to the help, which includes uh, a full tutorial that is self, uh, self-directed. And we have a forum, the VT SCADA software forum, right. where we will help you and other people can help you. Because uh, VT SCADA Lite, it's free. Uh, we, we don't actually offer uh, uh, call-in tech support because we just can't afford to. Yeah. So, but that said, um, I know that I just barely get the email to a lot of the form topics before Doug, one of our tech support guys, is already in there, right. and he's got it answered. So it's, uh, it's still, right now we're seeing generally faster than 24 hours to get a response. Um, that said, if it's in during our business hours, it can be minutes. Okay, I think, um, 
real quick, there's going to be, uh, for those who use the BT SCADA light and then want to add more tags or need an alarm dialer, we have pricing for that too. And that's just in the PowerPoint. And if you need, if you have any questions, let us know. Now I'm going to turn you over to, uh, to Natasha if she wants to come on and read some I, of the questions. I am here. So Great. I'm going to start with some questions. Um, and if you have any more questions, you can start typing them in now, and I'll get to them after um, the queue of questions that we already have on the go. So the first one from Howie is um, back when we were setting up uh, the redundant, um, the redundancy. He wanted to know about developmental changes and what gets synced between the two. Basically, uh, once you're synchronized, uh, the Historical data is all synchronized in real time. Uh, alarms and events history is synchronized. Uh, the configuration history that we just showed you, that's all synchronized. Um, I'm missing something. The historian. The, the historian, and uh, there was one more alarms and events. Oh, and the thin client server. Yes, thank you. Um, so that, And that's to say that if one application were to fail, then even if the thin client server was hosted on one, it would automatically fail over to the other. So basically, uh, it, it, what, what you end up with is that if you've got two different servers at two different locations, you don't necessarily need to run a tape every night to capture all your changes. You have two de facto, uh, up to the minute, backups of the system, of everything. And Alexander had asked a similar question um, about the two applications are synchronized. Do you mean code changes to the application or setting changes within the application? So you answered that one also. Yes. Yes and yes. Kyle had asked if redundancy requires two runtime licenses, um, which I responded, yes, at a minimum. Um, you can have as many redundant servers as you want. You need a license on each server. Just wanted to throw that out to the group. And again, VT Skate Lite, uh, the way we offer it is it's free for your first 10 copies. So uh, you can make those all redundant to each other. But, but each one, you have to install it on each server. For the paid version, you need to purchase a license for each individual server that you are synchronizing. All right, and then we have, um, is the 50 tag limit on the app or the install? How would you use this as a redundant backup if the limit is only 50? Say 10 sites at 50 tags? When did it stop or how does that work? Right, so the, the way that the 50 tag works is it's, it's 50 total I.O. tags, um, and that can be run against multiple applications. So you can have, you know, one application that's running in multiple servers, and that application could have 50 I.O. tags. Um, or you could have, you know, two applications, each running, say, 20 tags, and then that would be 40 tags. So you could actually have one application running on you know, one small water system, another application running on a small wastewater system, and then you could take those applications and run them on each other's computers and set them up to be redundant to each other. So it's, if you looked at the tag browser, it will actually show you. Do you want to bring that up, Chris? And then oh, yeah. we'll just show the, so if Chris was running more than one application, the tag browser will actually show him how many license tag he's using. So we can see right now, so right now, VT SCADA is actually using over 4,700 tags, and that's because everything in VT SCADA is built on these. But out of the license tags, you can see that he's using 20 out of the 50. Now, if he were to start another application that was using 10 tags, then he'd see in here that he had 30 used. So, in terms of potential applications, it could be, uh, so clearly this is meant for smaller systems. Uh, you can't do uh, you know, a, a large number of I.O. But what it means is that if you had your 10 licenses uh, and you were studying, uh, you, you're basically monitoring and controlling a, a, a single site, you could have 10 different workstations at 10 different locations that were networked together who could monitor and control and uh, manage alarms and, and that sort of thing. And just to clarify, um, this is a VT SCADA light. This is the 50 I.O. VT SCADA light. VT SCADA itself, actually, we've got people like the city of Sacramento who have hundreds of thousands of tags or of licensed tags. So, you know, huge, huge systems right. actually running the same install right. as what you're getting. That's right. It's the exact same software. It's just a different license. Okay. And Heather asks, can the alarm log be printed off to hard copy for reporting purposes? 
Um, short answer is yes. I was going to drive here. I don't know. Oh if yeah. You wanna. <laughs> do you want to? Do you want to? Um, so basically, yeah, you can do a print of the alarms, um, but you can also build reports. So I. I we didn't really touch on reports here today, um, but it's something that maybe we maybe we, we could do a whole webinar on that. Yeah. yeah, it's like you say, it's a bigger topic. Maybe just bring up the generic reports page here. Okay. So this is the built-in interface for reports. Um, you can see that we've got a, a bunch of sort of pre-built report types here, um, but basically you can click on any I.O., bring it across, and you can choose your start and end date for your reports, and you can also choose your output type. And then that was uh, basically print out a document uh, in a spreadsheet format, and uh, so you could do, this, do the same thing using right. alarm information, alarm right. event. So you could even see there's the notes and stuff there. Okay, and Don wanted to know, where do you view the alarm note? From the, uh, so we'll go back to the alarms page. You'll notice in the top right-hand corner here, we, uh, we've got an alarm going. So there's the, the alarm icon is blinking. So you just, from any page, you can click on that and go to, uh, go to that. Uh, this is kind of in the way here. So I'm going to add a note. Very good question. I forgot to uh, to do that. So right over here on the very right hand side of this green bar, you'll see this little note here, and I click on it and I open the note. But there are other places you can see it. Uh, there's a standard page for notes. If I, again I go into uh, alarms, reports, and diagnostics, I can go into uh, operator notes and find. Uh, there we go. And this is the notebook where we've been adding, see, note, bad thing, bad thing. These are the notes I've added earlier in the webinar. So you can see it all in sort of uh, in a single place, or you can go to the alarm itself and click on the right-hand side. Okay. And Lance asked if we offer an integrator developer license, um, which I replied to him, uh, we do. And he wanted uh, that as an example for uh, developing and modifying runtime instances for our customers. Uh, we do offer it. Uh, and we'll send out more information about that afterwards, following the webinar. Um, and Patrick wanted to know, any functions of VT Skater require scripts? Uh, that's a good question. Uh, but before I answer it, we're almost to time. So again, we'll stay here as long as we still, pe see, still see people uh, in the attendee list. Uh, but for those of you who have to leave now, I just wanted to say thank you for tuning in. We appreciate it. We know you're all busy. Uh, we hope you uh, enjoyed this. We hope you got a lot from it, uh, even with some of the technical bumps. Thanks for hanging in there. And uh, again, we're, we're, um, we're available. There's a contact page on our website. Uh, by all means, give us a call, write us an email. Okay, Great. Uh, go ahead. Thanks very much. Yeah. Um, okay, so the question I asked, uh, well, Patrick asked rather, was any functions of BT SCADA require scripts? Require, well, I guess some of them might, but basically everything that you do in the drag and drop environment, uh, write script under the surface, and that can be edited. Um, Did you want to bring up the page there? And uh, this one? Uh, just go into the Idea Studio, maybe, mm -hmm. and just for fun, show uh, the source code. So basically, this is what it looks like, and this is the script that goes into creating. Uh, those uh, those objects. So uh, you can literally copy and paste this stuff. Uh, um, you can copy an object on the screen and paste it into Notepad as code. Uh, and there are some people who create whole applications using nothing but script. So uh, I guess the short answer to your question is you can use script to do anything that you've seen already, I think, pretty much. Uh, but you don't need to. But if you wanted to do really sophisticated uh, customization, which a lot of people do, we're, we're using some very specialized fields uh, outside of the water wastewater industry, or even in the wastewater industry. Uh, and some of that requires uh, specific coding. But for, for the 50 tag license, for all intents and purposes, you're creating systems that you won't require script at all. Yeah, in fact, very few customers do actually right. require it. Some of them may come up with a special request to say, well, wouldn't it be great if, and they may learn how to do that in script. Right. But Lisa, it's not the standard, I guess. Right. 
Okay, I still have a list of about 14, 15 questions to get through, so if you do have any more questions, write them in. I'm not uh, not getting to yours, I just have a list, a queue. Um, and the next one's from Gilbert, and uh, it's, is VT Scale Lite a development runtime so the customer can develop? And is the 50 IO tag limit just IO or tag count? It's IO tags. And actually, if you look at a tag, um, I believe we have a list somewhere that says that if it will count against the IO, it's in the help files. So right. if you look at a tag in the help files, it will tell you that this either does or does not count against the IO or against your license. Yeah, the help is really good. And if you just, at any point in VT Skato, if you're developing or using, you can hit F1 and it will yeah. give you a contextual. So maybe a search analog status tag. And then you see here, there we go. Boom. So uh, in the help, you can look up that kind of that tag type, and it will tell you whether it's counted. But basically, if it's uh, I/O from um, from your process, then that counts. If it's uh, a font or a menu uh, or all kinds of objects, we use tags to even things like calculation tags. Right. Um, there's I think even the alarm tags don't count. Um, there's a lot of stuff in there that you might think counts, and really it doesn't. You know, it's it's really just those that are designed to go out, grab information, and get it. And also, if you make any custom tags, those count, because obviously, you could make all those custom IOs. And like Dave pointed out earlier, uh, you can see here in the tag browser, uh, this is how many tags for IO this uh, is used in this application. Or it's, that's used in all running applications. Right, right that's a good point. Yeah. And to go back to the first part, is uh, the VT Skate Lite is both a runtime and development license, so yes, your end user could do development. Um, right, and actually, it's maybe a point to just mention is that the when you're doing the development and you add the security credentials, part of the security manager is to allow things like the ability to develop, the ability to edit tags, right. the ability to log in on an internet client. You can even add areas and make it so that one group can only see pages from a certain area, where another group can see pages from another area. Right. So as the integrator, you can you can grant or, or revoke those privileges from people who do or don't need them. That's right. And we'll see a lot of people who are running sort of distributed smaller applications in VT SCADA who actually do this through more of a centrally managed structure. And then they're basically dictating which areas can be in one place. Right. So. That allows them to run multiple applications back to one server and do a lot of their management at the top level. Right. Okay, and Imani wants to know, can you quickly go over the import-export capability, please? Of which? Of, the, of, of historical data or of um, uh, what uh, are we... I'm not completely sure. Uh, she asked a 245. So what were we talking about at 245? <laughs> well, I, I'll, I'll give one example of, of uh, import export. I guess in the um, uh, the trend, uh, you, you can export. To, or, oh, actually, you can export uh, the tag database, right? Uh, to yeah, modify. you can export the tag database to Excel, and then you can actually use that to modify and update and write tags in Excel, and then just sync that back. So this is where I would do that. Oh, you know, yeah. export. export. So basically, I'm going to put it on my desktop, my garbage on my desktop. Uh, I'm call it export. They so say when when you're doing reports, you can set up your reports to be scheduled, and those can export a lot of your historical data. Um, you can export a lot yeah, of the is, information. He is talking databases. about historical data. Oh, okay. Right, okay. So that, that would be coming back to where we talked about the reports. Uh, yes, but you can also export data in a variety of ways directly from the trend viewer. But reports are a that's better true. way of yes, doing it. Like, right, yeah. From the trend viewer would be more uh, ad hoc, whereas from the reports page would be the, the best way to export data for a specific period of time for a specific number of tags. Um, and then export that to Excel or a, a comma delineated file. That's right. Uh, yeah, what Chris was saying. Um, is that exporting it from the trend viewer is a little more if you're just clicking and setting it up using the reports this is more common if you're just basically scheduled it for weekly whatever okay and Don would like to know what is the file type for importing pictures can a CAD dot DWG file be used 
No. No. But uh, most commonly, like uh, most things that you would export from your phone or your uh, point and click camera would. So a PNG, uh, a JPEG, GIF, or GIF uh, or GIF? GIF no, and GIF. I don't think actually. Oh, really? Yeah, I, I don't believe so. You see this all we do. But I think it's a BMP bitmap is one. But I would say 99% of what I'm doing is using PNGs for most of my graphics and using JPEGs for most of my backgrounds. That makes sense. OK, Alexander had asked if we could see the web component that they mentioned. But we did bring up the thin client. And as well, um, in a follow-up email, we will give you a link to, um, to look at that demo all on your own. But uh, for for just to this is what you're looking at right now. See, maybe do a click to trend on here just to kind of give the idea. Mm -hmm. So I'm in the thin client right now, except I'm looking at it instead of looking at it on a uh, on an iPad or a phone. Uh, maybe pull this back to a little longer. That might get busy. <laughs> That's a lot of information. Let's go six hours. Cool. Great. So uh, right now, we're in the thin client. So this could be in a tablet, on a phone, on a PC, on a Mac. VT SCADA Lite must run on Windows, to be clear. But the internet client can run on any uh, HTML5 browser. It's browser-based, which is why you, um, for this view, you can't actually use the reports on it. So it's a little different, because iPhones don't have a way to save uh, a spreadsheet file or a text document. So. Uh, yeah, basically, it's the same security. You're using the same login information that you would if you were. Um, I guess I'm already logged in. If you were logged in as, uh, if you're logged into your alarm dialer, which you don't have in VT Skate Lite, or through the desktop application, it, if you revoke the privilege from a user, then they lose that privilege everywhere all at once. Um, it's in real time. It's uh, it's. A very efficient use of your uh, data because you're only sending once you've cached the images from this screen then all you're doing is uh, transferring the changes so you're not getting everything all the time every time the screen changes it's just the differences okay I still have 13 questions in the queue so if you still do have other questions put them in uh, we're going to get to, we'll stay as late as you need us to, as long as you still have questions. <laughs> He's going to so. tractor pull. <laughs> <laughs> Just so you know, if you do put your questions in there, we are going to get to them. And Justin wanted to know, do your I.O. tags allow for reading arrays as a single tag? I'll say it again. I think <laughs> the, sh the short answer is yes, but the longer answer is I'm not sure how to explain <laughs> it. So let's hang on to that, and um, we'll provide a little bit more information. This is, it's, it's usually it, take, it doesn't take this long to stop us. So this is good. <laughs> so, we've, uh, so yeah, we'll find and the answer to that. And just so everyone knows, all of these questions also will be sent out in a follow-up email, um, and will be more detailed. Uh, and how we wanted to know, what changes require a system restart? Oh, this is a good, actually. This is great. So a system restart, you can actually update an application from a chain set file or from a whole bunch of... We should explain chain set file. Right, OK. Maybe you want to take that. OK, so uh, just backing up a little bit. Uh, so all of the configuration you saw us do in terms of changing screens, uh, changing many values, did not require a restart at all. Now, uh, let's say that you're the integrator, and you've got a, a copy of the client's uh, application and you uh, and the clients or the client says I've got a problem so they want to send you a copy of their application so again I'm going to open the configuration menu I'm going to uh, say create chain set and that's uh, a VT SCADA file that basically saves everything and zips it together everything that is unique to your application into a really tightly condensed thing so I'm just going to use the, the standard one for now I'm going to say create I'm going to say put it on my desktop I can call it what I like um, app one. So just as an example here, I'm going to place something gross on here. Ah, and it's gross. So if you go to that page, right? Um, I've already created the change set. So. Yeah. So maybe just pull up the page, and then you can apply the change set, and we can kind of show how that will. 
Oh, yeah. I'm okay. hoping that this will roll it back. <laughs> so now I've got this thing on there. I should be able to... Where's my chain set for app one? Uh, so the, again, application is still running. Um, this chain set was made before that. I hope. <laughs> We're improvising here. Oh, yes, I do. Sorry. <laughs> Read and talk. And then if you pull it up there. No, we didn't quite do it right. But basically what, what it means is that uh, as the as the uh, integrator, you can receive through uh, email or FTP one of these uh, change set files. You can make the changes. Oh, there it is. Just, just took a second. Or did you just get rid of it? I just got rid of it. Okay, <laughs> we cheated. So uh, you can take that chain set file and make the changes that you want and then email it back to the end user. And the end user, without much technical skill at all, basically it looks like, uh, oops, that's not it. I go to configuration, I go to apply chain set. Uh, I go select uh, app one. I think I just did it wrong before. Mm. Right, I guess we were, so we're back where we started. So, uh, so the, basically, it's a way of doing remote tech support that's really simple. And again, we didn't have to restart. So you can help fix someone's application, send it back to them. They can apply it with no skill, and uh, and not restart. So what right. what do they have to restart? So one of the big things is that if they're using OEM layers and they update their OEM layer, that's they will have to force top. a restart. Right. But again, that's going fairly far beyond what many people are doing. Right, version updates. Yep, so if they want to update the software from, say, 11.2 to 11.3 or whatever, then they'll actually have to shut it down and reinstall. Now, it is important to note that when you do an upgrade, it's really just installing the new version over the old version. So you just simply download the new installer, double click it, install it over the old one. All of your apps and everything will be updated to the latest version. And this is true, I think, from version 10 forward. Right, yeah, I think so. That's right, a lot of things changed in 10. Uh, right, and it's important to point out there that, uh, so this, our software has been around for about 28 years. Um, we have never depreciated a version of our software. We've always provided a timely method of going forward for people who were already using us. So at no point did we say, sorry, version 7 users, you're going to have to uh, buy a whole different version of our software and rebuild your application from scratch. Uh, that's, that's never been in our business model. We've always been able to find some uh, forward path for our customers. That's right. And paid users who have our support contract can actually upgrade at any time to the latest version. Right. That's a good point. And okay. Uh, Russell wants to know, is OPC UA supported under the OPC client driver? Uh, we support OPC Classic, so many elements <laughs> of OPC UA, you know, most of what people are doing is supported, but I don't know if we can say that technically we support OPC UA. I'm, I'm pretty sure we do not. Uh, I think that was a definitive answer. I, I think that's something we've been looking at. Uh, and again, we sort of, uh, we are a company of how many developers would you say in our different locations? 50-ish? Uh, yeah, I would say probably a bit less than that, but right. nonetheless, near 50, yeah. So we have the ability when uh, when we have a, a large demand for something uh, or, or there's something changes in the market and we need to adapt to, like the retirement of, um, of IPv5? Is that four? Yeah. Uh, then we can adapt really quickly. But we do have to be choosy about what we focus on. So things like this are just now coming onto our radar. And when yeah. the time comes and we really feel we need to have it, we'll make it happen pretty quickly. And a lot of people who come in asking about OPC um, actually realize after the fact that we have direct drivers to their PLCs. Right. Good point. They're often coming in from a different experience, and they realize that they can just go direct, and they don't even need their OPC server anymore. So again, consult our drivers list, which we mentioned earlier, to, to see whether you have a more direct route. And Norman wanted to know if there was a limit to calculated tags. Calculation, I guess if they mean, does it count against the license? It does not. I believe um, They can have as many calculation tags as they like. Um, it should be noted, too, that when they um, set up an analog status tag or something, that uh, there's some ability there to sort of interpret the data. It's a linear interpretation in those tags. Um, so they can basically take a 0 to 4095 and turn it into maybe a 0 to, say, 100 value, or in this case, we're converting to 0 to 25 feet. OK. 
Um, this question is, if I create PID faceplate like DCS, giving all information of PID like auto man, mode, etc. How many IO tags do I need to consider? Um, I don't know if we could answer that directly. Um, I don't know the faceplate that you're talking about, but in VT SCADA, you basically can anything that's writing sort of a data to or to a memory address basically is going to count. So if you had you know, 17 or 20 different addresses that you need to read to or write from in order to configure that uh, controller, then that would be the number of tags that you'd be using. Does that make sense? I hope so. If not, let me know um, a clarification. Things like faceplates, um, they would probably want to look at some of our help in parameterized pages. Mm -hmm. Um, because those can be used to quickly sort of copy and paste and apply one page that you've set up for a whole bunch of different uh, motor controllers or whatever it is. Which is a good chance to bring up something really quickly. Again, another we could do a whole webinar on just this, but our, our tag browser, which we showed you earlier, you'll notice is uh, is basically it's hierarchical, which means it's it has parent-child relationships. So you can create a whole, um, that's a good example of one here. Maybe just jump into the Modbus driver ah, there. There we go. Because you can show how even the pump one there is set mm -hmm. up with ch child tags. So you can see under stations, we have a, P a PLC Modbus driver. And within that, we have a pump. And then we have all of the different uh, 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 configurable uh, objects in that pump. Right. So what's neat about that is that you can make a page that uses parameters to say, well, for the pump, then here's all of the tags. But you can also set up the pump to have a um, have a, a piece in it and then use on your memory address use a parameter that references the pump to say then all of the addresses I can just copy and paste the pump I only need to change it to say pump 2 and then all of the you know in this case Modbus addresses would update to the addresses for pump 2 so I can do parameterized um, lists in the idea studio that will make it so I can just copy and paste pages and then link it to a pump and it gets all of the children of that pump. And I can do the same thing with my I.O. addresses. So the end result is that you can create a whole new uh, uh, complex object, well, I guess as complex as you can be with 50 tags, uh, in just a few seconds by copying the, the tree and, uh, and then, it, that, that, then that tree is passed as the, as the data component for a page. Yeah, and somebody who looks at their operations and configuration course will get sort of an introduction on how to do this. Right. Okay, so I still have about seven questions left, so um, if you do have any more questions, uh, put them in because we still have time to answer them. And uh, the question is, what is VT SCADA built in? But I think he might have meant built on. Um, well, we are, we're... VT SCADA is built um, on... VT SCADA and VT SCADA Lite, I guess, <laughs> are built on their own platform. Um, they're built in a code that right now is, I don't know, I guess just VT SCADA code. Yeah, VT SCADA um, script. And so the VT SCADA script, it was built and is optimized for SCADA type applications, and it's got a lot of really neat features in it where if you build something, there's a lot of um, error processing and other things that are done for you to help prevent a program from crashing or to make a program very robust, even device. when it's using somebody else's code. Right. Yeah, we also, we're not showing them here, but there's all kinds of debugging tools. There's all kinds of tools for doing some network analysis and other right. things. But you don't need to understand any of it to create fully functioning applications uh, that, that are quite customized. It's only in really highly customized situations that you need to do that. Okay, and Wade wants to know: uh, Will the machine, uh, will the machine, the free version, is it to be loaded on 64 or can it be 32 bit? I think either. Um, yeah, I believe 64. Yes, either. You, it's the same installer, which is nice. You don't have to have a, a different one for either one, and you choose during the uh, during the installation process whether you want it to be 32 or 64. I believe that's correct. Yeah. Okay, and you can you have multiple you apps running on? Oh, sorry. Uh, can you have multiple apps running on a single server? Yes, within your tag count. So the tag count applies to all running applications. 
So if, if you've got applications that total you know, 75 tags, uh, but only one of them's running, then you might be okay. Um, but if you, for all your running applications, you can't exceed the 50 tag uh, limit for VT Skate Lite or whatever your chosen paid tag band is for the paid version of VT Skate. So that'd be like 1,000 tag, 5,000 tag, etc. Okay. Howie wants to know what function is not supported on the thin client? Reporting. Well, and, 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 and just to back up, uh, in the version of the thin client that's viewed in a browser, so the one that you can look at on your phone, uh, that version doesn't support re uh, reporting because reporting requires you to save a text file of some kind or, or, or a uh, CSV. Or CSV. Or and um, there's no file system on an iPhone. So therefore, that is impossible. There's some other, like like the tag export, you can't do on uh, on a phone. So, uh, but there is the the original version of our thin client was originally just for PC, and it still works like a top. It's great. You open it using an ActiveX uh, component from a uh, again another link. So uh, that still works just fine. So if you're working from a PC, you can use the thin client. Uh, so it, it's just a, that can be a simple way of having a, a workstation instead of having to install VT SCADA, you could just use a, a thin client. But when you're using that version of the thin client, um, then you can do reporting because it, you're able to access the the file, say you know the the, the Windows file system to or to save those report files. Okay. So it's limited by the machine. Perfect. Norman wanted to know: Can you modify I/O drivers? That's a follow-up um, answer, Norman. <laughs> yeah, I think it's probably best to follow up. I mean, I, certainly you do so at your own risk. <laughs> uh, right now, this is my last question in the queue. So if you have any questions, get them in now. And Justin wanted to know, do screen support dynamic tag name substitutions in order to use a screen template? Uh, might, in effect, be the same thing, might it? I mean... Uh, basically, with the, the 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 template screen is is dynamically, like when you when you use a, a hierarchical tag tree, uh, you're using inheritance, so you don't have to like name every single part of it, and so when you make a copy of that tree, uh, basically it's am I saying yeah. this right? So I, I think the answer is yes. If you want a, t a tag, tr so a page can have parameters in the page. Um, and those can be things like the page name and other things. So you can import things like a, like a pump name or whatever as a parameter into a parameter as page, and then as you copy and paste that through, it will automatically update things like the like the page name. That's better. Thank you. So I think that that's so it, the same is true of widgets. So you can take a group of um, mm -hmm. you know gauges, or you can make your own thing or whatever it is, and you can link those into some tags, and you can just simply you know uh, grab them, say create widget. And then they they will come up with a special property, and you can you can actually go in and edit those widgets as well. Okay, and um, that's it for me. Great. Uh, well, thanks everybody. Uh, we last I checked, we still had like forty people on the hook. So thanks for hanging in there. Thanks for all those questions, uh, I, and we really encourage you right now, uh, again, the, um, on our website, you can easily find VT Skate Lite under Trials and Demos. Uh, it will also, the link will be embedded in the PowerPoint presentation we're going to send you. Um, with that PowerPoint presentation will be a link to a recording to this that you can forward and please do to anyone who can. We never say this, but we've got all the social media things. So if you're interested in VT SCADA and we have new stuff coming out all the time, we have a bunch of cool new stuff coming out very soon for June. Uh, follow us on LinkedIn, follow us on Facebook, Instagram, all of the things. Uh, and then uh, every time something new and exciting happens, when we're at a show, when we're doing some training, when we're doing a webinar, you'll be the first to know. But and thank Norman, you very much. Well, thanks very much. And just one last thing, I just wanted to uh, let Norman know he's asking about training courses in the UK, uh, because as you've seen at the beginning, we do have an office in the UK, um, and I'll get you in touch directly with Keith Norman. Great, cool. Thanks, everybody. Right, thanks very much. Thanks, Natasha. And thanks, okay. Jason.